You're listening to WMPG 90.9 Gorham, Portland, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way Galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me as always is Bernie Rhyme, DJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi Sarah, very good, thank you. Bernie's our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And you can head over to, them to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Okay, good. Yes, thanks for asking. So this will be Friday, November 5th. So we're going to have a waxing crescent moon, very thin. It'll be new moon on the 4th. So it'll be a bit of a challenge to even try to find it. It's only going to set half an hour after sunset, which will be at 6, and the sun sets at 5.30. So the days are getting shorter. They're just over 10 hours long now. And the evening skies have been pretty nice all month. You can still see three nice bright planets. Venus is in the west, probably sets about an hour and a half after sunset. Then you go about 40 or 50 degrees, and you can see Saturn. And about another 20 degrees, you'll see Jupiter. So you got those three planets. And then basically that's it for the planets. They'll be setting around midnight or so. But then you can also look for some meteors. There's a shower called the Taurids around the 8th, so in a few days. And then we have the Leonids on November 17th, but the moon's going to be full then, so you won't see too many. But anytime you're out there, um, I actually have a project for my students to be watching Jupiter and Saturn every clear night and to make keep a log and get some comets, to get some outside and that type of thing. And it'd be good if you know as many people can get out. I just saw them again the other night. It's really nice to see the planets lined up there. So it's a nice evening sky. Thanks, Bernie. And if you couldn't take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. So today's show, we have a very special guest, Dr. Joseph Staples, who is professor of environmental science here at USM. He holds a PhD in biological sciences, science and a master's in environmental forest biology and chemical ecology. Welcome to the show, Dr. Staples. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so I know that you have some research focuses in environmental entomology, forest ecology, arthropods as vectors of disease and disease transmission. And then, of course, you're very passionate about teaching methods. What brought you to this point in your life and why, why environmental science? I'm, I'm from uh, mid-coast Maine originally, and uh, my dad was a clam digger, <laughs> right? And so I did that in school and, you know, sort of stumbled my way through. And I never had any intention of, to, to going on to, to university. So I was working, uh, I was building stone walls, cutting wood, training horses, doing whatever I could to make ends meet when I was, you know, in my teens. And then I decided to join the army because I had nothing else going on, right? And <laughs> Did well uh, and, and became a paratrooper and got into, uh, you know, I was an intelligence analyst in the military. I remember while I was in, I took a break. Uh, I was down in North Carolina, Fort Bragg. I was lucky to have a library next to me. And so I'd take my lunch breaks. I'd go to the library. I had to sign out of the secure facility. I bet I could find it. But I remember <laughs> a hardcover Time magazine book. They used to put these books out. And they weren't very thick, you know, lots of pictures, you know. And I remember pulling this book off. Now, this is in the late 80s. And I pulled this book off the shelf in the library. And I looked at it. And it had a windmill next to a house. The house was a wealthy house. And it was, it was just lit up at night. I think this house was in Arizona, somewhere in the Southwest. Beautiful night sky. And, uh, and it had a 40 foot uh, uh, windmill, you know, windmill blades on there, the diameter. And I looked at that and I fell in love. And I, I looked at everything in alternative energy. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is what I wanna do. And so I decided to get out of the field I was in. Uh, I, I decided I'd attempt college after all. <laughs> There's this thing I heard about, right? <laughs> um, and uh, and and then I got out, and I was still a little hesitant. And I, I dug clams. You keep going back to the thing you know. I got out yeah. and I dug clams, and I, yeah, do I want to do this? So I did. I I, I found a, a college in upstate New York called uh, the College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse. 
But at the time, it isn't like that today, but at the time they didn't have freshman or sophomore. You had to do two years out and then transfer in. Mm -hmm. And then it went, uh, you know, junior, senior and graduate students, PhDs. So I did my two years at a, a, a small college, two-year college in upstate New York. Um, loved it. Had a great time. Had a great mentor there, uh, Robert Dorrance. I have to say his name. He's no longer <laughs> with us, unfortunately. But um, he was just inspirational. And, and one of the few professors that I think could have pulled off wearing his cap and gown while he lectured. You know, he was really just that extraordinary. And so I did my two years in. And I walk into ESF. And I go up to the, the, the room where they had uh, alternative energies. And, uh, you know, they, they had a whole degree program in that. I said, I want to do this. Now, I had to do a lot of legwork to find this, right? Uh, this is before the internet was a thing. <laughs> and so I had to, I, so I'm finding, I found it, I marched. I'm under the impression after two years, I can go get a degree in environmental, uh, or excuse me, alternative energy. And I walk in and they say, sorry, the, the previous administration cut all those funds. Oh. And I just, I was accepted to the school. I stood there sort of like, what do I do next? And so I just started taking classes in biology and really developed a fascination with evolutionary biology mm -hmm. and applied biology. In particular, I started working with a guy out there named Steve Teal, who um, uh, was um, uh, Jerry Lanier, who's a famous uh, uh, chemical ecologist uh, back in the day, in the early days, so to speak. And he, he got me involved in working with uh, bark beetles and sawflies and looking at how they communicate with chemicals in, in the environment. And then I finished up my, my four years there, wondering what to do next. He invited me back to finish the master's degree. And then I went on to work, uh, you know, finished that, um, and then went on to get a PhD in Illinois, um, continuing to work on you know, pheromones and things like that. So it, it was sort of the securitist route. And in any room, I, you know, I'd work, I, I mined crystals in upstate New York, Herkimer no Diamonds, some people know what those are. Um, you know, I, I'd work in offices, I'd take some time, take a you know a few months and, and work in, in different jobs. I worked for Atlantic Salmon Commission. I just did anything I could to immerse myself in, in biology, but I didn't realize at the time, I mean, I had a degree in environmental forest biology, chemical ecology, but I really didn't realize at the time, but I guess we all do this. We look back on our lives and we can kind of see that continuity, that, that trail that brought us to where we are today. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that, that's just amazing. I remember digging claims as a kid and just sitting there and just looking at stuff. You know, I was six years old. I was making a dollar and a quarter a day, which was big bucks back then, right? <laughs> you know? And I would just watch life around me, you know? And so I could see kind of how that all got me into that. And so I continued to teach at Illinois for a little while and came uh, to Maine, because not because there was anything here, but I wanted to be here. I'm from Maine. <laughs> and taught at uh, a few colleges in Maine and, and then finally made myself as indispensable as I could here at USM so that they could never ask me to leave. I'd say yes to everything. Um, and then uh, I've been fortunate to have wonderful students over the years. And, and been able to, I started building my lab from eBay at first, and then I started doing it properly with, with grants and stuff. And, um, and now, you know, it, it, I'm really getting good traction on building a state-of-the-art environmental entomology, chemical ecology lab, as well as doing work. I've done work with Hubbard Brook, collaborative work with Hubbard Brook, folks out there in forest uh, systems and I've developed a smart forest system here at USM. We're putting out sensors so we can monitor what's happening in an upland small forest um, in real time. And so that's kind of how I got into it all. Um, just saying yes to everything and, and continually moving forward in the field. It all started with alternative energy. And, and so I kind of brought that back. <laughs> you know, I still, I talk about it, I teach it. I, you know, I use as much passive as I can in my own house. Um, and, uh, and, in, you know, but I, I wound up getting into biology more than I would have ever imagined, but it all makes sense when you look back in hindsight. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think part of our jobs when we talk to people and be role models is to talk about our life as if it all made sense. Yeah, it's crazy. No, <laughs> no, you know, it doesn't. But, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> one of my approaches to, to all of this is because, because I'm so broadly trained, right? And mm -hmm. I, you know, I bring a lot of what I, I, I was doing as just a kid working on cars, you know, uh, you know, and things like that. So, 
couple of, three or four years ago, we got a patent on a new microscope light. And it was because I was tinkering with it. I couldn't get the right lighting for my microscope. So we built one. Hey, it was patentable, you know? And, and so I sort of bring everything to the table. And I try to do that with my students. Take risks, build it, you know, come up with a brand new idea if you can. And I'll support you because I have this broad background. I, I could probably support you in just about anything in, in the sciences practically at this point, um, and, unless it's out looking at the night sky. But, but it would be interesting. <laughs> Whenever somebody talks about, you know, the night sky, I think, of course, the, you know, like any citizen, I think of the Zodiac. All right, bear with me for a second. And I think about um, um, cancer, right? The, the, the constellation cancer and the, the crab. But actually, there's some evidence to suggest that the ancient Egyptians actually used the scarab, the beetle, as, as a reference to that constellation. Hmm. And if you look at ancient Egyptian uh, art, you know, the, the scarab is represented prominently throughout you know, the mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. you know, dynasties in, in Egypt. And that's really quite fascinating. So that may also have influenced our idea that, the, you know, so one of the many species of scarab beetle uh, is a dung beetle. Mm -hmm. So it rolls dung in these balls, buries these balls, and then the, the new beetles will emerge from that fly off, find new, new, new homes to, to roll. There's, there's a whole ecology with that. But what's, what's interesting is, is I've heard it, it described that maybe the idea of, of the dung beetles rolling this ball, burying it, and then new beetles emerging from this might have inspired the phoenix myth. Oh. Right? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's uh, yeah. a lot of observation to, to, yeah, <laughs> to come yeah. up with that. <laughs> Wild? Yeah. Yeah. So I was just fascinated by that stuff. If you look at insects and myth, of course, um, you know, locusts, of course, we think of that. You, mm -hmm. you know, think of the swarms of locusts. Um, you think of what the spider means to us. You can, you know, I'm sure it's a Jungian archetype. I don't know, but I'm assuming it would be um, that sort of thing. They, they definitely have been prominent in our history. And mm. I'd, I'd love to have time to study it a little bit more. I probably will in a few years, but <laughs> right now we're doing applied entomology. <laughs> we're trying to bring it back. <laughs> Speaking of beetles, you are currently on sabbatical. Mm -hmm. And you are studying specifically the Japanese beetle, which is invasive. What are you yep. What are you doing with that? What are you hoping to learn? Okay, so um, so a lot of folks know about the Japanese beetle. We have it. You, you probably see it on your rose bushes, um, uh, and um, you know anything you don't want them to be on, they're on. In years past, in, in this area, we saw pretty significant outbreaks. Mm -hmm. it, it's such a big deal that even the, the uh, I was down at a conference one time and there was a couple of Air Force individuals at a conference and they were just talking about, I don't know if they're recruiting, they're talking about what they're doing with entomology and you know all of the branches in the military have experts dedicated to entomology because- Wait, wait, wait why? <laughs> oh, so <laughs> because uh, they can vector disease, right? I mean, yep. if you think about it, I'm gonna leave the beetle, I'll come back to the Japanese beetle. Okay. But, if, if you think about uh, the spread of different diseases by uh, lice and, and ticks and mosquitoes, and especially during major conflicts, you know, you could argue that pesticides probably helped win World War II because you could hear mm -hmm. some of the stories that they, they talked about in the trenches where um, the soldiers are talking about these, these young Italian women, you know, they're running their fingers through their hair and they had so much lice that it was actually, they were actually pulling, you know, bloody clumps out of their hair. Of course, you're worried about the spread of typhus and things like that. So, um, so the military, of course, uh, it fits their mission. You know, they want to make sure that you know their their soldiers and airmen, and sailors, and, and marines being are eaten alive by bugs. They're healthy. Uh, you know, yeah. millions of people uh, die each year from um, you know a half a million kids each each year from malaria, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's still a big problem, and things like mosquitoes still. Our problem for you know populations around the world, and so um, so it continues to be an issue. But what about the other aspect of it? The Air Force was interested in Japanese beetles because of their impact on agriculture, right? So you know, eleven million dollars in say you know Georgia or something like that. I don't remember the exact state um, could be attributed to um, ornamental and agricultural damage due to Japanese beetles. And so we have a long range attractant. Somebody else discovered 
the long range attractant, um, I think it was Tumlinson in, in Florida, um, years, decades ago. Um, the long range attractant, Japan allure, we call it, refer to it commonly. And you can go down to the hardware store and buy it, right? And it will attract Japanese beetles to these traps. You might see them out there, these yellow traps, just full of beetles in, in, in the big years. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I always think it's kind of interesting because you're attracting beetles to your yard. So the best thing to do is probably put it in a neighbor you don't like. Put it in there. <laughs> it might be a better idea, right? But um, so you attract these beetles and it works great. It does attract them. Um, but a couple, oh God, when was that? Four years, four years ago? Five years ago? I forget. I have always have students trying things. I love using undergraduate students which, you know, <laughs> to conduct preliminary experiments, which informs a lot of my work today. Um, and it gives them great experience. So I had a student working on willow beetles and we just couldn't get enough willow beetles. So I said, you know, let's just try these Japanese beetles. I know we already know there's Japanese Japan allure out there for the pheromone. The pheromone is as attractant released by the females to attract the male um, in, this, in this case. Um, and then um, a male could release the pheromone as well. Um, and, uh, and so, all right, well, let's try the Japanese beetles. And I put a male and a female Japanese beetle in a, in a clear Petri dish together. And the male jumped on the female or, or walked up onto the female and he grabs a female and, you know, we, you know, it, it, you know what's going to happen then, right? Um, and then, um, and then he rocks back and forth on the female and he had, and, and so I was like, oh, that's in her. And it's a very predicted sort of bop, 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 back and forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I bet he's vibrating. He's communicating because he's vibrating. Now I'm going to bring this back to chemistry here in a second. So I take an acoustic guitar pickup and I stick that under the Petri dish because you, you, know, you, you stick that on a guitar and you can hear even yep, the, yep. the lightest. So I put that on a Petri dish and I ran that into a video camera. So now I can hear it and now we can see it. And I'm like, oh, listen to this. And the male, I have videos of the male going, don't, 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 don't. And you hear this, zuh, 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 zuh. Now that's telling the female that he's a male and it's probably allowing her to judge his quality, hmm. right? Uh, I mean, so if he can, if, he, if he's got a, a, a really nice, deep, very white vibration voice, you know, <laughs> so and she's probably like, all right, right? So, so I'm thinking, oh man, I bet it's not just the long range attractant with this. I bet that there's a contact pheromone, a chemical produced mm -hmm. on the female's cuticle, her shell, right? That covers the, the, the front wings on a beetle are actually, you know, the elytra that cover the hind wings, which they actually fly with. And I bet that there's a contact pheromone there that the male is recognizing. And so he's like, oh, well, you're a female and I'm gonna tell you how extraordinary I am. So, <laughs> zip, 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 right? So I'm like, all right, first, what we need to do, we're going to record this. I, I should have ran with this. So I said, I'm going to wait for a couple of years until I can get what they call a Doppler laser vibrometer. So you shine this laser down on the top of the beetle and you can, you can measure the vibrations by measuring changes in the, in, in the distance that light travels, it bounces back and, um, and what have you. So I waited and I finally got, these are like $30,000, right? So I finally justified it with grants got this thing and then i assigned another student to go and continue this work and we'd already presented a poster on this uh, that's very important she said she came back to me a couple hours later and said a team in michigan already published on that with a doppler laser vibrometer they totally scooped us on it so mm -hmm. all they did however well all they did they did extraordinary things um but what they did was they were able to characterize the vibration which we had done and they they had the I could have just ran with this. I didn't. I wanted it to be perfect. So I let perfection be the enemy of progress in this case. Um, and um, But they didn't talk about the specific chemical that was doing that. And so this has been an itch I can't scratch, right? So finally, I got my sabbatical. I says, I'm going to begin to work on this. And so over the summer, I collected a bunch of these beetles. I've been going through um, and extracting the cuticle of these beetles and, and making comparisons. I don't have an image of them here, but making comparisons of using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. So I inject a little bit of chemical into this machine. It goes through and it separates the chemicals by their size and charge. Then that goes over uh, uh, an ion source that blasts these chemicals apart and they come up with these very um, characteristic fingerprints, these fragments. 
And then we measure those based on an intensity. So I'm, I'm drawing in the air here, you know, a, 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 a little hill. Yep. Um, and I, I'm looking for that and I'm seeing some very specific compounds in, in, in association with the female. Um, it's harder than it thinks. You just can't inject that and figure it out because I collected these from the field. I didn't rear them in the lab, which is probably the next step I need to do. Um, and there's, I can't eliminate contamination. So I'm occasionally seeing these on, on males as well. Hmm. So it's hard for me to say it's just a female compound. Hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, <laughs> right? All right, so what if I finish this? What if I can get through this and, and, and you know, I, this gets legs to it and I can say, this is the chemical. Hey, by the way, I can make the beetle vibrate. Um, and and I, I, I'll, you know, put this on something and the male will try to mate with it. Um, marble or something like that. Trying to make a dancing beetle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, but how would you use this now, right? right. And so the way you'd use this, so the long range attractant we know works, but I was thinking if we have the short range pheromone, which is, a, a you know, a, a, um, a, it's a sex pheromone. It's, it's stimulating the beetle uh, to either accept the male and, and, and produce offspring or not, right? Whereas the other one was an attractant pheromone. If we can spray this all over our rose bushes or all over our um, our tomatoes, don't worry about it. I know people like to spray this all over. We're, we're inhaling pheromones right now from each other, uh, from the environment, from trees. They're all around. But if the beetle gets onto the, the plant, it's like, oh, female, and starts like getting confused and trying to mate with the leaf <laughs> <laughs> or the tomato or whatever, right? then he's going to, hopefully we can disrupt some of this mating and we can reduce that population of Japanese beetles, mm -hmm. at least site specifically, if not over a broader range. I, I just don't know how well this is gonna work or if it will work at all, but identifying the pheromone and characterizing the behaviors where I'm at right now. Wow. Yeah. It's both funny <laughs> <laughs> and really right? brilliant. Yeah. It works, it'd be great, because that's yeah. one of the worst pests. I knew someone who loved bugs, and the only bug he didn't like was the Japanese beetle. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, they're a fascinating insect, and it's so interesting because we do have to disassemble them sometimes. And so <laughs> what, what I'm amazed by is the, the cavity inside the beetle, uh, where it should be filled with hemolymph and what have you, often just seems almost empty. It's the wildest thing. Now, I don't think it is. It may be that my beetles are old, but... It, even when you give them to chickens, sometimes they're like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't feel like those today. You know, <laughs> I mean, they will eat them on occasion, but um, yeah, it's, they're, they're just, they're, they're not the most pleasant thing, you know, and you don't see everything going. If, if beetles, if Japanese beetles were really tasty, you know, let's say they, you know, maybe they taste like Boston cream pies, <laughs> everything would be going after them. And you see them out there when they're in an outbreak and birds aren't flocking all over the plants with lots of Japanese beetles. So yeah, they're a problem. You know, yeah. it's, it's a little tough. I mean, they're there's they're they're persistent. They're here with us now. They they've become well established, and there are newer invasive species that we're mm -hmm. certainly worried about. But the Japanese beetle seemed like it was something. I just I need to finish this. I need to answer this question. You know, <laughs> either yes or no. I don't care. But I I want to move on past it. And <laughs> I was so annoyed that I let this this project. You know, I let the other team scoop me on this. <laughs> Is the idea that if you figured it all out and ended up deciding to commercialize, I assume, what, how would you actually create that? You'd be creating essentially like an artificial pheromone based on those compounds? So another pheromone I identified was for another invasive species years ago, and this was called the Pine Faults webworm. And this particular uh, sawfly, so it's, it's a hymenoptera, uh, Symphyta. So, the, so there are uh, two two primary uh, suborders of Hymenoptera. So the Hippocrita and the, the Symphyta. So, um, so the other one is you know the the thin waisted wasps, bees, ants, and the other one, the Symphyta, is the broad waisted um, uh, Hymenoptera. And we you know typically associate those with sawflies, horntails, and things like that. So um, the uh, this particular sawfly. Uh, scientific name, Acantiolita erythrocephalix. It's got this red head, uh, the female does. It actually, it has an interesting way of producing a pheromone. Um, so first of all, it was likely introduced in the, in around 1914 
and then started to build up. And we've had a few outbreaks. And guess what? They really they'll eat Scots pine, um, pitch pine, red pine. But when they discovered eastern white pine, they found steak. They thought that was awesome, right? And they'll go into outbreak on eastern white pine, and they can they can actually, if not kill the tree through repeated defoliation each year, because they eat the, the most recent year's needles, mm. um, they can weaken the tree so that secondary um, oh. uh, insects, you know, predators, uh, you know, plants have predators, right? Um, so secondary predators can get in there, um, in particular, bark beetles. So mm. different species of bark beetle will burrow into the bark create these chambers and then it interferes with the flow inside the bark you know um so um so years ago um i was working with this insect and we discovered that the it was such a hard insect to uh, pheromone to identify um because um I, I i raise these beetles in the lab i'm like i haven't quite got to that point with the japanese beetle yet but i raised these other ones in the lab and i couldn't find a pheromone i couldn't find anything different between male and female and then it happened that I was working with a colleague who was probably the third person to ever find this, um, wherein he found that the chemical that he extracted from a different species of sawfly, I think it was the wheat stem sawfly, when they exposed it to UV light, sunlight, right? You know, there was a large chemical that wasn't volatile. It just stuck to the, the cuticle of the insect. But when it was exposed to UV light, it broke that apart at one of the double bonds. Oh. And that smaller fragment became volatile and mm -hmm. was the pheromone. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if that's happening here. And I had watched these guys emerge early in the spring. And I thought they were just avoiding predators. But they emerge and you see the females will climb up the tree and out onto a branch and they'll, they'll bask in the sun. So if I held my hand over the female, she tried to move out of the shade. Mm -hmm. Like you know and, uh, and i was like oh that's interesting so i i put them under simulated sunlight in the solar sim a chamber that simulates solar sunlight and exposed the the insect to uv light and then lo and behold a whole new chemical came out and guess what and i could barely see this chemical it's such a small amount but when the males like so, so when you do this kind of work you and you put micro electrodes into the antenna of the male again hook that to a, a gas chromatograph the chemical separates and then goes over what we call an electroantenographic detector. So I'm measuring the depolarization of the neurons in the antenna. So I can see the sort of action, but it looks like an action potential, right? The nerve fires. So I'm like, wow, this thing is going crazy with just a little bit of the stuff, you know, down almost a picogram amounts, right? So I'm like, this is, this is interesting. I bet that's the pheromone. We all were like that. I was working with two other people on this. And so we synthesized it, right? And then what I did was I extracted the beetles, excuse me, the, the sawflies. Some of the sawflies I exposed the extract to UV light, some I didn't. Some females I exposed to UV light, some I didn't. And then I used the synthetic pheromone and I put that all in the field and I compared how many males each one of those treatments would attract. And my synthetic was, it was exactly the same compound, but you got to demonstrate this. Mm -hmm. um, structurally, it was the same. 619 pentadecadienal or something like that. I can't remember, <laughs> I forgot. And it attracted the same number, if not more males. So now wow. what we can do is we can, there's a couple of ways you can use this. You can put the trap out there and you can say, I want to monitor when they're out. So I know what I can do something then. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be a, a localized dose of pesticides and not. I'm not advocating for one thing or another, but at least you'll know, you won't just keep spraying things everywhere. Or you could, you could put so much of this pheromone out into an area where you have an infestation that the males can't find the females. And that works with like the pink bollworm pheromone that they use uh, in cotton. So you could do those two things. And so that's called mating disruption, right? So, uh, so really, I'll narrow it down to those. So those two things would allow you to either monitor when the insect is out or uh, disrupt behavior the mating behavior in an area an entire area if you're lucky now that's the silver bullet that doesn't always work you often have to come up with another plan but knowing when they're out and, and scheduling your response is important so yeah, yeah. so yes yeah, so you synthesize the pheromone it's a long-winded answer to your question <laughs> and and there are whole companies that do this now one of my colleagues 
um, Derek Chikailo uh, has a company that synthesizes pheromones and makes those available. And you could ask him, if I develop a new pheromone here, I could, I could say, hey, this is the structure of this. Can you synthesize some of this for me? Yeah. And I'm going to test it on, you know, wherever we're having trouble with Japanese beetles. Thanks to Dr. Staples for joining us for today's conversation on beetles and developing pheromones. Stay tuned. We will have more of this conversation in a future episode. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG 98.9 Gorham Portland with myself, Bernie, and Dr. Staples. Stay tuned for something for the weekend with Anella. And from your favorite nerds, just a reminder to vaccinate, to mitigate, and then we can all congregate.